listening to the Jersey Guys Podcast, the show that talks about hard rock, heavy metal, AOR, and West Coast music. In-depth conversation and special guests are always on tap, so settle in and turn it up. Now, here are your hosts, Tom and Mark. Hey everybody, this is Mark Ballow from the Jersey Guys Podcast. I'm here with my co-host Tom Coyne, and today we've got special guest Dirk Kennedy from the band Hitman, and uh, this was a pretty good one, right Tom, actually? Uh, uh, highly entertaining, yeah. uh, probably one of, uh, one of my favorite, if not favorite podcasts, just from an entertainment. When I initially contacted Dirk, he said to me, it sounds like fun. We'll have a blast. We'll have a good time. And he was right. We did. <laughs> Boy, did we. <laughs> um, as you'll notice, if you're looking uh, at this and listening to it right now, you're going to see this is probably our, our, well, not probably, but definitely our longest podcast ever. Uh, so uh, we hope you guys enjoy this one. There's a lot of laughs, a lot of uh, great, crazy stories. Great, great stories. Dirk. And uh, mm-hmm. Dirk was a great guest. And normally um, we, we don't run podcasts for two hours and... We've had a few guests, no names mentioned, that probably could have ran to two hours that we short-circuited a bit. But this was uh, such a good interview, so entertaining, and I hope everybody enjoys it as much as uh, the three of us did making it. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, warts and all. So t- right. two full hours coming at you. Uh, so check this out, Dirk Kennedy from Hitman. Dirk, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a lot of fun. Can't Thank wait. you. Hey, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Um, Tom, well, who uh, else? Who else wants to talk? To you? <laughs> there you go. Nah, nah, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> Unless you're in Greece or Germany. But I, but I'm just going to say that. Don't cut yourself short. You have quite a following in Europe. <laughs> in Europe, yeah. 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 As we but, do too. As they say, they're big in Japan. Right. right. When, <laughs> when you look at our, our, our numbers on YouTube and you see 3,500 people, 3,400 of them are from Europe. Yeah. <laughs> Of course they are, because they're the only people who right. care about good music. Exactly. We're big in London. You know, like a, like big in, hey, hey, we've never big, been big in London. We've never played there. Okay. Nobody's ever given. And I've been over there so many zillions of times. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we never could get a deal. I went to a bunch of labels there. Can never get arrested in that town. Oh. A lot, of the, a lot so of the British great, bands can't yeah. either. So, I mean, it's. Well, it's, I guess that's probably true. Yeah. But <laughs> we, we've got to just say that. Some of the best metal has definitely come from the UK. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Rock in general. Yeah. yeah so. For sure. Well, um, I'm going to start you off here since I grew start? up in Brooklyn and you're from Long Island. So I'm from Queens. Oh, you're, not wow, from you're Long even Island. closer to me than... No. Where, where about in Queens? I am from Jamaica, Queens. Okay. I'm from Gerritsen Beach, Brooklyn. Which I is, have no idea where that is. Do you know what King's Plaza is in Brooklyn? Yes, of course. It's, yes. Yeah. It's a mile away from King's Plaza. So if you know that area, that's Marine Park. Oh yeah, Marine Mil- Park. Mil- Bay, well, yeah, situated yeah. kind of right between, right in the middle of Mill Basin and Marine Park, like kind of in mm-hmm. that area. So, uh, what I wanted to ask you is how the band originally got together, and when you did get together, what were your uh, formative bands that you were influenced by? Uh, I I think it was collective. Everyone kind of was on the same page. Um, I answered an ad in a in a local paper. And I, I'm Jimmy's tried to correct me a couple of times. I thought it was the music paper, and he said it maybe was the Island Ear. And these were kind of classified um, papers. They, you know, they would talk about Zebra and mm-hmm. all the bands that were popular, Twisted Sister, whoever was big on Long Island. I was a Queens guy, and of course later John was also a Queens guy. The rest of the guys were all from Long Island. Uh, but I answered a Long Island ad. I was sitting around in a bowling alley on Union Turnpike one night with some friends. And, you know, I had had some experience with some other things. I guess we could talk about that a little bit, too, Um, like the early formation of Anthrax and all that stuff. But I wasn't quite ready because I was 14 and I needed some training. I needed some experience. I didn't have enough. So I was studying with a with a voice teacher and I thought it was time for me to get in a band. And uh, I didn't try to put one together. I just wanted to join one. Mm. And I found an ad. And I answered it, and I took the Long Island Railroad to Belmore, New York, where Chuck Corey lived. A beautiful home on the water. 
and he lived with his mom and his brother. And uh, he picked me up, and I had a demo tape, and uh, I brought it with me, and it was all kind of Dio covers. <laughs> it was like Heaven and Hell, and uh, I think I might have done like Tarot Woman or some some rainbow song. I have the cassette somewhere. It would be funny to listen to it. And I, I played it for them, and they liked it, and we talked about our musical influences. And at that time, uh, I was listening to, obviously, Ronnie James Dio, obviously Iron Maiden. This was 85, and of course, Queensryche, because he mm. came and mopped, and mopped the floor with everybody, yeah. especially if you were a singer. When he came out, you went, uh-oh. Um, it was, you know, he was the equivalent of Eddie Van Halen, for singers, you know, he changed the game on what singers could do. Because, you know, neither, you know, maybe Rob Halford to some extent, but that was mostly just kind of just screams. It wasn't more of a legato or melodic, you know, high register. He's he kind of set a new bar. So I was listening to Queens, right? The warning was out. Mm -hmm. I was listening to I was listening to Striper tremendously. And everybody was kind of afraid to admit it, but they were all like, yeah, they're pretty cool. That's interesting. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah, we're and Jimmy was really into Accept. Okay. Um, but we were all we were all first and foremost, every single member of Hitman was a giant Kiss fan. I mean, beyond fanatical. Is to that this kinda, day, kind of where the the Hitman everybody always talked about. And I never saw you guys, but I know that the talk is that you guys had a great stage show. Is that kind of taken? Well, from that, I or? mean, I would say maybe a silly stage show in the beginning because. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Michael, our dear departed bass player, um, always kind of wanted to be the demon. Mm. So the initial, they already had the name Hitman, by the way. Uh, there's a wonderful guy that's a singer on Long Island. His name is Scott Knight. He's a wonderful fellow. And he was the singer before me. They, it, something happened. I don't know. It didn't work. He's a terrific singer. I don't know why it didn't work out. But he had actually coined the name. He wrote down a bunch of names on a piece of paper, and they liked the name Hitman. They thought it you know, could denote a couple of things visually. So initially we got there, and you know, I was like a little chubby, and I had like kind of like a bad bob. You know, I looked like maybe like I was wearing like a bad Jolin Turner wig. But it was real. But it was real. It was just kind of like, um, like a Prince Julian thing. I looked kind of like a Renaissance Sir Lancelot kind of bangy haircut. It was terrible. <laughs> and so Mike goes, first things first, the hairdo's got to go. Because everybody's from, they're all from Long Island, so they'll talk like that. Yeah. Right. It's like, that, that fucking haircut's got to go. Yeah. And uh, uh, by the way, we're, we're going to do like a show, like a Kiss show, but with like maiden music. And I went, okay, that's interesting. And he had all these sketches. Him and Chuck had all these sketches of like what they wanted to do. They had the Hitman logo already. Like they were branding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They were already branding what this was going to be. It was going to be, a, you know, and Chuck, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Chuck has gone on to be one of the biggest pyrotechnic guys in the world. Oh, really? He did, did Iron Maiden, Kiss, everyone. He's based in Las Vegas, and he blows up everything there. Oh, wow. So our first shows, we had concussion bombs, flame transporters. We had all <laughs> kinds of pyro. And we're just so lucky we didn't become great white because we blew the yeah. shit out of everything. Wow. That's interesting. And we never had any kind of issues because he was a serious licensed pyrotech from the day I met him. Wow. I would actually, he'd send me on these errands. I would go to a place in Long Island City, which oddly enough, I've lived in for the last 30 years. And I would go to a company called C Factor. And if you look on the back of Rainbow Rising and Kiss, they did, they got all their stage sets, props, drapes tarps, pyro, lights from C-Factor. Huh. So he was one of their licensees, and I would go there and pick up. He'd be like, give me 16 concussion bombs, three flame transporters, wow. all these bombs, and I'd take all this pyro and take it down the Long Island Railroad and deliver it. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, so we did. We had like a – we wore costumes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you want to call it that. Everybody had kind of um, an aura color like the Kiss Solo Records. Because, I mean, they were almost afraid to ask me if I was a Kiss fan. I'll tell you, to this day, there is no one in the world who can challenge me on Kiss trivia. I know everything. There's nice. nothing I don't know about Kiss. Oh, um, right. Even the crappy Kiss, I like it all. We're going to have uh, you do but, a, uh, you know, a stump the trunk with you and, and Eddie Trunk together, maybe. <laughs> oh, I could, I would destroy him. <laughs> There's no doubt in the world. I would definitely, I mean, you know what? Uh, Kiss was like a religion for us when I was a kid. Wow. And, um. I always kept, even on the records that I didn't care about and how silly and stupid and kind of drag queen-y it got later on, 
I still cared because they set me on the path. Oh, yeah. And, you know, uh, so Mike and I used to do Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley impersonations <laughs> all the time. Be like, <laughs> it's not, you know, it's like, hey, this is Paul Stanley from because um, this is Gene Simmons. Very we would just do these funny things and we would just have a pisser and we would do it all the time. So at one point, I think he wanted to do alter egos, and I think I just put my foot down and said, "No, I can't yeah. do that. <laughs> That's that ship has sailed, my friend." <laughs> but yeah, we were all on the same page musically. Um, I think maybe I was a little bit more, um, you know, like a little Lord Fauntleroy with my, you know, Dioisms, and you know, it, it took me a while to figure out what how to how to sing in that band correctly. Um, they were looking for more of, I guess, like a Jeff Tate, Bruce Dickinson guy, and I was definitely more of a bluesy, doe kind of guy. Okay. Uh, but, like, you know, I was very, very young, and, and I also lied about my age, and I also pretended I was British. Yeah, no way. <laughs> <laughs> I, went down to, I went down there, and I'm, meanwhile, I'm as Irish as, as get out, you know. Well, you know what? Joe jo and Turner has those kind of British accent pops up every yes, once in a does. while, right? So, you know, so there you go. That's just being pompous. <laughs> exactly. There you go. <laughs> That's all it is. Now, I like went down there because I was really young. And when you're very young, people don't take you seriously. So I went down there with like a British accent. I was like, oh, yeah, we live in London, blah, 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 all this kind of oh, yeah, show. And, <laughs> and I pretended I was British for about three months before I finally just said, I'm from Queens. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I mean, it was just a hilarious thing. I just, and then I said, oh, and, and I'm also on 18. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. And they were mad at me, but it was working out musically, so they let us know. It's a funny old story with him, and I just completely lied during my audition. Yeah. <laughs> so now, how how did the the I guess the first demo was the 1985 demo. That's a famous yeah. the famous one that everybody uh, talks about. Um, yeah, we call it the White Cloud demo because we recorded it at a studio called White Cloud on Long Island. Okay, how did that get constructed? Who you know? Did you guys you collectively know? write the uh, the material for that? Listen, the, the the when I got there, there were a lot of there was a lot of stuff. They had pre-planned so much stuff. They had this game plan, this world domination game plan. Hmm. Uh, they had the name, they had the look, they had uh, Jimmy's incredible songwriter. They had, had written, you know, Metal Sport. So on that demo was Metal Sport, Dead on Arrival, um, not Dead on Arrival, sorry, uh, Sleepless Nights, terrible song. Um, live, for live, for live for Tomorrow, which is a Michael jimmy collaboration um i was able to contribute some small bits and pieces to winds of warning and metal sport but i think that's the extent of of what i did for that because they already had a bunch of songs and they knew they wanted to find the right singer and they wanted to get right in the studio and they already i think within three months i joined the band in march or april and by july we recorded that demo so it was really pretty quick and uh, Jimmy worked for Important Records at the time, which was a big record distributor. And um, I remember he brought down uh, a couple of the new Motley Crue record, which was called Theater of Pain. Mm -hmm. Now, I've always hated Motley Crue. That's not my thing. I don't like that kind of music. I don't like the, the way they look. And then I was like, oh, now they're really drag queens. Mm -hmm. Holy yeah. crap. And uh, Mike loved all anybody's imagery. It didn't matter. He loved Wasp and he loved Kiss and he loved Motley Crue. Anybody who dressed up and put an effort. And I agree. I don't like uh, jeans and T-shirt bands either. I want you to kind of look like you're you're gearing up for a performance. Oh, me too. Yeah, I'm very big on that. I still yeah. am to this day. I, me too. I want musicians to look better than the guys that are in the audience. Right. If I look better stage, than you, you're yeah. doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, you know, there's guys that just show up. And they have like a pair of jeans on and an old maiden shirt. And mm -hmm. like, meh, kind of the mystique is out of it. You know, we grew up in an era where bands were idols, you know, yes. and they had a mystique. And, yes. you know, they were bigger and better and somebody larger to idolize. Larger than life. And, you know, a grunge partly destroyed that thing. And, okay. you know, um, so I like rock stars. Me I enjoy too. them. I think they're great. Uh, we don't have them anymore because we've got horrible rap stars and hmm. you know, influencers on YouTube and Instagram and all these vapid people who have no talent whatsoever, but they tell you where to get a great mojito. Yeah. Um, and exactly. people have 5 million followers and this girl showed her snatch and right. now she's a billionaire. Right. Yeah, 100% right. So, yeah. you know, there are bands out there that are still trying to do that. I don't know what the state of that is, but... Um, I do appreciate a band that that puts on a bit of a show, you know. I do too. You go to see Iron Maiden, you know, they they look like they're performing in an arena. Yeah. 
you go to see Pearl Jam and you could have watched seen that in a club. Right. Yeah. You know, it's just a guy with a Les Paul and a T-shirt. And yeah. yeah, not my thing. <laughs> I grew up in the 70s and I saw pretty much every major band at Madison Square Garden in the 70s and still have a reco- a vivid recollection of every one of those shows because of how big they w- these guys were as rock stars. Whether it was Jethro Tull, Black mm-hmm. Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, all bands that I saw in the 70s. You saw Led Zeppelin? I saw Led Zeppelin in 77. I went on the third night. Wow. Yeah. I believe my I have a sister who's uh older much older than me and she went to see she saw Zeppelin and uh she's the one that got me into all the rock that I love today. And uh she would show me these records, Aqualung. Yes. And Elton John was my first big love of music, I guess. Other than like the Partridge family or something like yes. that, you know. I still love him to this day. I still love him as a vocalist, David Cassidy. I think he's a genius. Oh, I have um, all his solo records. His solo records are true. Old Dog, New Trick. Yes. Do you have that one? Yep. <laughs> but if you listen to those Partridge Family records, they are they were all recorded by the Wrecking Crew. That's right. So it's all the greatest musicians in the history of recorded music and some of the best songwriters in the entire world. Yeah. And David Cassidy, who was a great pop singer. Yeah. Terrific. A lot of the monkey stuff was that way, yeah. too. I mean, Same thing. That yeah. was all Boyce and Hart and uh-huh. Neil Diamond. Yep, exactly. I mean, Neil Diamond wrote I'm a Believer. Yep. I'd like to sit in a room with Neil Diamond and write a couple of tunes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so yeah, getting back to that whole thing, um, the whole imagery and the whole thing was very appealing to me when they said that. I was like, oh, I like that. And also Striper, which is oddly because our very first show ever in the history of Hitman, we opened up for Striper. Oh, really? We did. And uh, I said, oh, I really like Striper. And they, you know, I said they sheep- sheepishly admitted that they liked them too because you can't deny the guy's an amazing singer. No, they're great course. guitar players. Yeah. And their records sounded great. Michael Wagner produced them. They were great. And uh, a couple of months later in November, was it November? November 11th, 1985, uh, Jimmy had a friend uh, who worked for the NASA Community College um, I guess entertainment league or whatever she was in charge of and striper were playing and we begged her to get us the opening slot and she did. Oh, wow. So that very, was our very, very cool. first show. Nice. And we wore, some, we wore some kind of costumes. <laughs> I think my, I think my, uh, aura color was purple. Purple. No, that's my favorite color. <laughs> and what tour was, what tour was that for, for striper? Soldiers under command. Oh, nice. Okay. That's really yeah. on second album. Yeah. I have my Bible that they signed for me. And that's cool. They're yeah. very nice. Um, I didn't see them doing any blow or, yeah. you know, hanging around with groupies or anything. They were sweethearts. No, that's, so. that's a great band. Uh, two yeah, two yeah. guys sitting here yeah. that you're talking to are big yeah, fans. Huge yeah. fans. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. some of their new stuff is great, too. I wanted to go back a little bit. You touched on it a minute ago before we uh, got into the whole beginnings of, of Hitman. But sure. let's go back to your early time. And you mentioned uh, a tie-in with Anthrax. Uh, mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about that story there. Well, the story with that is one of my uh, best buddies was a guy named Jeff Delusha, and he was um, just a local guy, and he went to the Bronx High School of Science. And I used to sometimes cut my high school and go up to his high school because it was cooler and more fun. And he he had an acquaintance there, a, a girl named Marge Ginsburg, and she had a, a jacket, a, a hand painted jacket, because you know we all had painted jackets back in the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, your favorite band, you'd have like you know Destroyer or Rainbow Rising or whatever. Sure. You'd get some local artist to paint your favorite band on your denim jacket. So she had a jacket of a band called Anthrax, and I said, oh, that's really beautiful art because my uh, childhood friend Ricky, who's a bass player from a band called Bile, he painted everybody's jackets back in the day. And I said, oh, did Ricky Beckel do that? And she said, no, somebody else did. And I said, what's Anthrax? She said, it's my boyfriend's band. I said, who's your boyfriend? She goes, uh, Scott Rosenfeld. Hmm. I went, oh, okay, I've never heard of them. She goes, well, they haven't really done anything yet, but they're really good. And uh, she goes, they're looking for a singer. And I said, I'm a singer. <laughs> she goes, what, do you, what kind of music do you do? I said, metal and hard rock. And she said, well, how old are you? I said, well, I'm 14. <laughs> and she said, well, you're probably too young. Uh, I think at that point he was probably 17 or 18. I'm not quite sure how much older he is than I. Um, but anyway, she happened to be babysitting in our neighborhood in Jamaica States. And uh, she told me the address and she said Scott would be there and I should come along. Well, I went and I met Scott. And what did, what did we talk about? Kiss. 
Hmm. Okay. Because he's a giant kisser. Sure. Yeah. And he was bedazzled by my ridiculous uh, knowledge and breadth of knowledge of all things kiss. And um, we hit it off on a personal level. And he said, "Listen, you sh- you're a little young, but you should come down. We rehearse at the now f- infamous Jamaica Music Building." Where later Metallica lived off of uh, hot plates yeah, and sure. ate yeah. a, a, a pork and beans out of a can. Oh yeah, everybody's um, heard those stories. Yep. Yeah, it looked like it looked like Beirut down there. It was the yeah. worst neighborhood in the world. Everything was burnt out and blown out, and vagrants and winos and drug <laughs> addicts and all kinds of crazy people. So I went down there. I was picked up uh, by their then drummer Dave Weiss, very nice fellow, and uh, they had me learn. Oh, I, I'm actually jumping ahead. We went to New York City to some rehearsal place, which I will never remember the name of. And they asked me to learn a couple of songs. They were Princess of the Night by Saxon, mm-hmm. Hellbent for Leather by Judas Priest, Another Piece of Meat, and Lights Out. So I had to learn those songs. And I did. And we rehearsed them at this place in in Manhattan. And it went pretty well. We did them a couple of times. They played me a couple of their originals. Uh, and I do remember some of the names of them. One was called like Across the River, and I think that might have been on their uh, their first album, which was what Fistful of Metal, I believe it was. Yes. Um, I haven't really followed their career so much, but so we rehearsed for about I'm going to say five to six months, and then they just started to adopt a much heavier, more aggressive sound. And at this point, it was Scott Dan Loker on bass. And another guitar player whose name I don't remember, and uh, Dave Weiss on drums. And we rehearsed, and you know, I still felt I had some learning to do. And uh, so we parted companies, and then they got his brother Jason to be the singer for a while. I actually mm-hmm. went to go see them at my father's place, which is a oh, yeah. small bar in Roslyn, Roslyn Long yeah, Island. Sure. And I went to go see them, and you know, I enjoyed it. And then they went on to do their thing. But oh, that okay. was my involvement with Anthrax. You yeah. know, people, a lot of press and mention has been made of it. Essentially, I was just, you know, one of their placeholder singers in the very beginning. There was a guy before me named John Connolly, and then there was me, then there was Jason, and then they got, um, forgive me, the guy on the first album before Joey Belladonna, Neil, Neil Turbin. Neil Turbin, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, looking at Tom, because um, Tom would know that better, more, yeah. better than I. <laughs> I, was, yeah. I was never a huge Anthrax fan. I like I, I, I really wasn't either. I had a couple yeah. albums I liked. No, that was good stuff. Now, uh, yeah, I mean, we don't have to veer back into that, so we can we can kind of kind of go back into the hitman stuff with with. Tom yeah, well, too. that that was where it went, and then yeah. you know, I used that. I, I, was, I, I listen. I knew Scott Rosenfeld was going to be the. I knew he was going to make it. He was so driven mm-hmm. and so ambitious. Uh, there was no way in the world that guy wasn't going to make it. And then a couple of months later, uh, this band from San Francisco moved in. <laughs> that was Metallica. managed by John Zazu. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was managed by the same manager that Anthrax was managed by, John Zazula. And Scott saw the writing on the wall. Mm. And he jumped on that because th- we were playing maiden y, UFO y kind of metal rock. It wasn't that. Yeah. And then they adopted that other sound. The thrasher, he went for it. Yeah, yeah the third. They, yeah, he, you know, he got that from them for sure. Wow. And he's very smart. It was a great move because now he's one of the big four. Yeah. I mean, there's a big there's a big difference between Metallica and all the other three. Yeah, <laughs> I think Lars is selling Picassos <laughs> and, uh, and Rembrandts. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and having uh, having um, psychiatrist sessions at the Ritz Carlton, San Francisco. <laughs> they would never. They were never my thing. I, I did, that was a one band that I never could get an ear for. But that's Metallica. Just, yeah, not my thing at all. Hmm. It's not my cup of tea. Um, you know, they, obviously they've got a couple of great tunes, um, but that's that type of thrashy rock. I like a good chunky guitar, but it's not my sound. You know, I gotta uh, have uh, I gotta have really good vocals. If with that type of music, I have to have good vocals. It's, I mean, you gotta admit that James has carved out a pretty unique niche for himself. No, he has. Um, he has. I mean, I'm, I'd be a fool to deny that, but it's just yeah. not my. Uh, Never, never was and never will be my thing. Do you know, I have I have a philosophy about singers. You can be the most talented singer with the best range in the entire world, but if you're a clone or get lumped into a category with the guy that already made his mark doing that, you're a lot better off being a, a James Hetfield or an Ozzy Osbourne because the second those guys open up their mouth, 
you instantly know who that is. Yeah, there's something to be said about that. It's no, got I'm a not, lot more yes. currency than being a Jeff Tate or a Bruce Dickinson or a DEO wannabe. And, you know, listen, I count myself within that, you know, that framework. Uh, I have always been a pretty good impersonator. And um, I, it, to, to my fault, uh, sometimes I feel like I do a pretty wicked Klaus. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I've always had a penchant for being able to copy people. And while over time, we got into a lot of trouble with that on the second Ant-Man record. We could get to that at another point. Um, because I do a really nasty Bon Jovi impersonation. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I used it on records, uh, which it completely alienated our fan base. Yeah. Well, I was going to bring um, that up when we got to the second album. We were well, gonna... we, we will get yeah, to that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you know, everybody thought it was fun because I, I can do so many different things that way instead of sticking to one thing, which, I, uh, you know, 30 some odd years later, I realized, you know, that was all just a dumb idea. Hmm. Uh, when you get a when you have a singer in a band who's, you know, like it reminds me of like Mark Fleischman was the original singer on the Vinnie Vincent Invasion. Not that anyone cares about that project at all because it's right. horrible. Yeah. But Robert uh, Fleischman. Robert Fleischman, right. Robert Fleischman. Uh, then they got Mark Slaughter and Mark Slaughter doesn't sing like that at all, but he completely copied it. Yeah. You know, and that probably ruined him because that guy's actually got a really pretty voice. Mm-hmm. Really pretty singer. Yeah. You didn't like and... the first Vinnie Vincent Invasion? <laughs> no, I don't think you did either. Oh, I did. I, <laughs> oh, did I you very really? much did. <laughs> Boys are going to rock. It was and... just so over the top. that And Fleischmann's vocals, I loved. I don't know. I think it's kind of like nails on a chalkboard. Really? Yeah. A lot of, you're not the first person to say that. but I, it, I, I mean, it, in small record. drips and drabs. Yeah. No, in I, small I, drips and drabs. I'm a fan of that record. I can uh, tolerate, you know, the screechy thing. Uh, I always liked the creamier singers, the guys that ha- had a little bit of the bo- both things. They were able to go and do that screechy stuff, but you know, like Tony Harnell, mm. you know, what what a meg- another oh, yeah, Marty, no. uh, another Marty Lawrence uh, a student. But Fleischman was just singing falsetto on that album. If, if you've heard, you know, Fleischmann. that's not falsetto. That's that's mixed voice. <laughs> you think that's, so? <laughs> uh, well, yeah. I mean, that technique is called mix. It's a combination of head and chest. It's not pure falsetto. There is power behind it because falsetto right. is Frankie Valli. It has very little right, power. Right, but like Fleischman it. has. I mean, Fleischman has put out AOR albums. I mean, he's got yeah, you know, a, sure, a, a really good voice across the board. It, it was a campy album, but I like. You know, but I it was like of camping. the time. It was of the time. <laughs> yes. I mean, look yes. at all the. I mean, everyone was trying to out drag Queen each other. Yes. I mean, Vinnie Vincent. You know, let's face it, an ugly mud of a guy. Right. Uh, he was lucky to oh, wear the Ank Warrior for whatever he had to do. And then the next thing you know, he's wearing garters mm-hmm. and la- lacy panties. Right. And, uh, you know, I mean, he just looked like he was walking on 12th Avenue in the meatpacking district. Right. And, and speeding up his guitar solos. <laughs> oh, is that what he did? I had Absolutely. no idea. Absolutely. He did that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And plus, you know, we had a guitar player in our band, uh, and I'm not going to mention his name because he's been a complete asshole to me. But we had a guitar player for a very short time in Hitman who played just like that, who was uh, referred to as the buzzsaw. Mm-hmm. And it had no melodic rhyme. And this was a person who was an insanely talented guitar player, could play like Aldi Miola or one of these incredible jazz fusion guitar players, but chose in the rock realm to just sound like he was like a, in a slaughterhouse. <laughs> it was this evil, you know, I mean, Vinnie Vincent solos, other than on those couple of Kiss records he did, um, were just, what the fuck was that? It's just, <laughs> sounds like Charlie Brown's teachers. Yeah, yeah, it was all that crazy <laughs> sweet picking. and uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sweet picking that, you know, um, like the only thing that Ingve Malmsteen never did good on the first three records and then completely became a slop fest mm. later on. Ingve Malmsteen's best guitar playing was on the first Alcatraz album. We spoke, I spoke about that with Mark Bowles when I had, had him on. Yeah. I loved that record. Yeah, the first Alcatraz, no parole for me. I loved no. his best guitar on that playing record. that he's ever done. He's never played Cree, that Cree melodic. Knockery. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So melodic. Jet to jet. Yep. He Beautiful. played for the songs, clean, melodic. Yeah. yeah, it's the best he ever. He's he's never duplicated that. No. Well, you know, when you're young and you're full of fire, that guy was such a great student of Bach mm-hmm. and Paganini and all the Albanoni, because uh, you know he nicked uh, Adagio. 
He nicked that. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Uh, uh, he really was a student of those great classical composers. And then, you know, he just lost the plot and he just decided to do the same old sweep, you know, diminished minor runs and all that same thing. It's just, it's repetitive. And, you know, I don't. The, the the Odyssey record he did with Joe was back to back to songwriting. Yeah, so it's about Joe the song. Joe probably yeah. insisted upon it. There's yep. great stuff on there. That song, Dreaming, Tell Me, what yes. a song. Yeah. Woo! Hold Fantastic. On is a great song. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Crystal Ball. Uh, Crystal yeah. Ball. Yeah. Crystal Ball, yeah, it's, it's great, great stuff. Yeah. And he He's did a couple albums doing it. with a Swedish singer uh, named Goran Edmund that were very I've melodic. heard of him, yeah, but I've never very heard melodic of also. I saw him. And was he, able to, was he able to keep his dick in his pants? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he really came off the hook like going into the '90s. Is really when he really completely lost his mind with all of that insanity that he was playing. If you look at most of his stuff during the '80s, the, the Mark Bowles record had some great melodic songs. The Turner. Oh, record, that album is fantastic. Yeah, Chelsea. the two albums with Gore and Edmund were, were melodic. Yeah, he he lost his mind pretty much like '90 going forward and uh, i mean now he doesn't even use a singer he sings himself i mean it's well he's got that he's got <laughs> giant walls of amplifiers mm -hmm. yeah well, that, that are all, <laughs> all empty, all empty. <laughs> <laughs> i mean he is sick i mean this is how how delusional he is he's singing his own songs yeah and he doesn't have wow voice. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm, I think I'm going to be the lead guitar player on the next Hitman Man. Right? There you go. Right? <laughs> you know, and I, he doesn't um, even have a decent voice. I mean, if, if no, he, did, he you can't can say, sing okay, at all. Well, right. So, all right. What I wanted to talk to you about is now you guys get signed to the first full album, which oh, was oh, di oh, oh, did we? You, well, <laughs> Steam Hammer, I believe, right? That's not how it went down. Okay. Well, you, that's that's why we have you here. <laughs> so there was a, a terrific guy named Michael Schnapp. And he worked for Epic Records, and he's kind of legendary in the hard rock metal world of that time. And we liked him a lot. Now, we were, we, we, we were getting, like, some interest. These labels would come to our shows. We used to pack out Le Maurice East. And we really played Brooklyn only once because by that time, the, the brothers that owned those venues had, were in a fight or something. And you, could, you couldn't play one and play the other. You had to pick right. one. Right. I, I remember that. So period, yeah. we... We had started at Le Maurice East and played there a lot. and But Brooklyn was the more prestigious gig, obviously. It was a little more Brooklyn. And we, I think we played there twice, and we were given the ultimatum, you can't play Queens again. And we couldn't do that because we actually got paid. Right. <laughs> we would go there, and we would get paid like fifteen hundred, two grand a night when we played there. And we got to open for some cool bands, not Queens, right? That was political. Mm -hmm. We really wanted that show. But we got to open up for a lot of cool bands. So we decided to stay at Le Maurice East. And um, uh, labels would come down and we weren't getting any bites. And we had this tremendous press swell from Europe because of our, our little demo that we did. You know, we were on the cover of Kerrang! magazine. It said, who will dominate in 88? That's how old I am. Oh, my God. <laughs> who will dominate in 88? You're still younger um, than me, so don't complain. <laughs> well, so, like, we had all this press and we just couldn't figure it out. Um so we, Michael Schnapp had left Epic Records or one of the labels he was working for, and he was going to work with a German company who were opening up an American office, and it was called SPV Records. And there was no steam hammer, none of that crap. It was SPV, and they wined us and dined us, and we, uh, we had a, a very nice lawyer at the time, but he obviously wasn't very good. And we signed a deal with them because Michael Schnapp was involved and we loved him and we thought he'd be great A&R for us. And we we had already recorded, um, I'd say, 80 percent of the debut record with money we borrowed from our parents. And they gave us a further fourteen thousand dollars to do Breakout. Will you be there? And I think it was Secret Agent Man. Mm -hmm. And uh we finished the album. We did it in Long Island at uh, Cheeky Studios in Glen Cove. So we we finished the record. It was produced by a nice guy named Bob Spencer, who we did some demos with later on. And uh, the day our record was, they, they had an office on Long Island. The day our record was supposed to come out, uh, I went and I called Mike Schnapp, and nobody was answering the phone over there. <laughs> Mike calls me up. He goes, it's all gone. <laughs> I said, what's all gone? He goes, I came to work. And everything at the office is gone. 
my SPV God. kicked up everything and bolted out of the United States. Wow. <laughs> so they, we didn't know what we were doing. Our album was supposed to come out. <clears throat> we, you know, all the pressings were going to be available that day. We were going to be able to go down there and see it. And it was going to be released. It had been reviewed on in Billboard. <laughs> wow. We actually had like in the old days, Billboard had an album review section. The picture of our album was there, and it was a very nice review. And we, "Will You Be There?" was uh, the number one most added song on the Friday Morning Quarterback, which was a very big radio barometer back then. Mm -hmm. And we actually went to these Friday Morning Quarterback shows, and we saw Mr. Big, and they played on a raft. And we were like, "Oh wow, we were gonna have, we're gonna have a hit single. We're about to do a video," and they bolted. So <laughs> now we have no label. But then we find out that we do have a label, but it's a German label. Mm. And all of our contracts in the fine print said if they ever do abandon mm -hmm. the territory of the United States, it reverts to German law. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so our album's in limbo now. Now you have but no product have, in America, we right? We have There's, no product. Yeah. We have nothing. Wow. But we've had all this press. We've had Billboard. We have the number one most added single to rock radio. This, my uh, my old friend Mimi Reichenbach worked for Polygram Records, and she was friends with a girl named Jill who works for the, the vice president. And she goes, "Hey, my friend's friend's band's really good, and they're getting all this press, but they got this German problem." He signed us to Polygram. Well, tried to sign us to Polygram, I should say. We, within, I guess, over the course of about five months to a year, they were trying to negotiate out of our German deal. Polygram Mercury Records was trying to get us out of our deal so they could grab the record. We actually had the imports stopped, seized at uh, John F. Kennedy Airport hmm. because they were trying to illegally import the record into the United States on Steamhammer Records. They're the metal diversion, uh, the metal ver uh, division of SPV Records. Mm -hmm. So. Well, this story's not very fun, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, um, so Polygram was trying to to buy the album back so that they could issue it. And, correct. And yeah. actually get it on the and, shelves and promote you guys. Right, and, and, and try to salvage what was left of the press that we had. Yeah. And, uh, they were unable to do that because SPV wanted a million dollars. They wanted a million dollars to let us out of our deal, and they signed us for $14,000. They <laughs> wanted a million bucks, and they wanted to retain percentage of the sales of the record. And by that time, after a year, uh, th this guy, Harry Palmer, who was signing us, left the label completely. And then they, we were picked up by a guy named uh, Jim Lewis, who immediately tried to put me in Yngwie Malmsteen's band. Oh, really? And that's where that story comes from. Okay, in. yeah, you mentioned that before we went on air. You, had, you said you had an Ingve story, so uh, yeah. Go I ahead. do. <laughs> so Hitman is still trying to figure out what we're doing. We're, yeah. still, we're still kind of being signed by Mercury. They're still trying to figure it out. Ultimately, this guy, Jim Lewis, uh, who was trying to put me in lots of other bands because he did not like Hitman. He liked me, but mm. he didn't like the band. Uh, we were still waiting for him to say, yay or nay. Yeah. He goes, listen, Inge Malmsteen's doing a new record and you'd be the perfect guy for him. Do you know him? I said, not personally, mm. but I like his records. I said, sure. I mean, he was still cool then. Yeah. I like Inge. Well, he set up a meeting that happened in uh, Worldwide Plaza, which was Mercury's then headquarters in Manhattan. And Inge Malmsteen was there, and he was wearing like head to toe leather and like boots, like pointy cowboy boots. Yeah. And he was wearing makeup or whatever. And he was sitting there while Jim Lewis did all the talking. And they said, well, uh, he's going to, uh, you know, he writes all the songs. Uh, you might contribute, but he gets all the publishing. Uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. All these incredible terms. And then he told me about the money. And I looked at him and I said, I could make more slicing bologna. <laughs> and I left. <laughs> oh, boy. So and this, I walked just, out. Just to interrupt you, this fit in at what period of, like, what? where was Baumstein coming out of? You would know better than I. Well, whatever. give me the year and I'll tell That'd you. Be 80, yeah. 80, 89, 89. I think it's after Odyssey. Just after. Yeah, well, that's probably. when Goran Edmund came in. Goran Edmund yeah. was with him in 89. He recorded an album in 91. It would have been then. Okay. Now, he also said, Yngwie is also going to perform vocals on some of the record. Did he do that on any of the No, records? he did not. Goran Edmund sang both albums in their entirety. 
Okay, because he did say that. And I said, oh, I didn't know you sang. And he kind of just, he barely said anything. He just went, I do, I do. And he was like, he had one foot up on this kind of desk. And he was just really not paying much attention whatsoever. And he was kind of there, but not really there. Yeah. It just it felt like a Spinal Tap skit. And, you know, I was, you know, I had gotten offers to be in Vandenberg and a couple of other things. Dream really? Theater. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Dream Theater, the, 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 I knew we know knew those guys, and I was friends with I'm, their manager. I'm more impressed with Vandenberg than Dream oh, Theater. Oh, that, that that happened. That that was never going to happen because I that's not my kind of music. And they like their singers like a guest star, you know. <laughs> they they have like you know blah, 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 guest vocals. Blah, 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 you know, yeah. They they're all incredible musicians, and I love Mike dearly. Um, but you know that's not a singer's band. There's no writing in that band. But the well, you Vandenberg would have fit in thing, with Vandenberg. That was a very uh, song-based uh, band. I mean, they were all. I, I loved that band, and I saw them on their first tour. Uh, they played some club in Long Island, and I remember that guy Hugo on Long Island it sounds just like Steve Perry opened yes, up for them. Yeah, sure. And uh, I saw them, and I loved them. Bert Herink, the singer. Bert Herink was the singer. And, yeah. Yeah, I, Josh Zumer, Josh great Zumer with the electronic band. drums. Yeah, Dicky Kemp. He had on bass. he played North drums. That's yes. what they were called. Right. North. That's right. And uh, I thought they were great. Uh, so their manager got a hold of me. I do not know how. It was, I guess, on the strength of the demo because we did not have an album out. We were like only like a year into Hitman, and they contacted. They called me at my parents' house. Somehow they got my number, and uh, I turned it down i was like no i don't i don't see that happening i was very happy in it man i was i was always too happy in it man <laughs> well, you know, we're, glad, I, we're glad you stuck around because there was a lot yeah. of good things to come yeah I, I just always felt like i liked the guys especially you know how it eventually settled out with when john joined the band in 87 um i just you know john's like my best friend in the whole wide world and i just felt like it was a great creative outlet you know, it took me a long time to get songs in there because Mike was such a stickler and he had such a game plan. But once he kind of gave up on being the demon two and gave up on, you know, any kind of guar slash kiss slash mm -hmm. whatever presentation, you know, we, we we still wore outfits in a way that we looked like we were on stage. But there was no more of that kind of character thing, which I always thought was stupid because, you know, there was that already existed. So why would we want to do that? Well, let's let's get into it's it's five long years between the debut album and the second album. Um, you talked a minute ago or a second ago. You said something about you, it took you a while to kind of get in there. And is that kind of in the songwriting? Uh, no, area, not necessarily, or? because we had a lot of songs. Uh, no, um, the, the only reason why it took five years to make that record, because we still played a lot. It wasn't like we just sat on our asses. We played all over New York and Connecticut. We had a big following in Connecticut and we played all over the East Coast. Um, we just couldn't get arrested. Mm. But uh, now you, you we, had obviously had all the problems with the, the SPV and Steamhammer, um, uh, you know, Mercury trying to kind of get in there. It obviously didn't happen. Um, you know, so all that time goes by. What what at what point did you guys start writing for the second album? We were always writing. And I've okay. always said my story is Vivas Machina would have been the chronologically had we been allowed to make records in the timely fashion that we should have, it would have been our third or fourth record. It would have been a natural evolution, mm -hmm. like it had actually been, because we wrote albums worth of songs in between that, as we evolved as players and a singer and all that stuff. We were too busy being morons. <laughs> we were too busy fighting with a, a, a wonderful guy named Monty Connor at Road, Road Racer Records, mm -hmm. who's a terrific guy, and like I I was probably the biggest douchebag ever because I resented the fact that he was putting my record out when I didn't believe they had the right to do so. So, you know, this is also where youth plays against you. Yeah. Um, what we should have done was we should have embraced the fact that Road Racer Records was a big company, Roadrunner, who had licensed the album. For SPV. We should have just grabbed it and promoted it and toured behind it and done all those things. But no, we resisted because we were we had bad legal advice. We were told, no, don't do this, don't do that. Finally, I got a great attorney, or so I thought, who was Bon Jovi's attorney and TNT's attorney and all this stuff. And so we're trying to get a deal and we're showcasing forever. And we're just not getting arrested. Just nothing. We're still getting cool press in Europe about the first record that we put out four or five years ago. So by the time 
Vivas Machina actually showed up. We had recorded it in 1991. It came out in 1993. Isn't that great? Just mm. at the precipice of Nirvana yeah. and yes. Pearl Jam and all yeah, that. Yeah, the timing was was absolutely horrible to say the least. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm certainly you know not the only victim in that uh, in that gangbang because obviously everybody got you know sure. shot to death in that thing. Yeah. Um, all the bands that were out there. I mean, you know, you had White Snake and Molly Crew and all these bands, mm. Winger, and they're dead. Yeah. <laughs> so we had consciously or, and or unconsciously because Vivas Machina when you listen to that record as a whole yes there are some kind of Bon Jovi-ish moments that were a million percent intentional okay. because I had the ability to sing kind of a commercial sound right. and I ran with it because I was egged on by not just not certainly not Michael he hated it hmm. but like other people in the band who thought it was cool because I did it well and uh we were told that if we had some stuff by some various record company people, uh, that aforementioned Jim Lewis eventually backed out of uh, the Hitman deal and said, you know, it's not going to work for us because write some, some commercial material. Hmm. So we wrote a couple of commercial, commercial-ish songs, but we also had the most prog shit we ever did. And that was uh, Answer My Prayer, Mercy. Uh, we had some extremely uh, radio waves, some very progressive moments on that record. It was interspersed with... You know, people remember like the worst song we ever wrote is a song called Partners in Crime, and it's absolutely an embarrassment of ages. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, if we reissue that record, I'm going to try to make sure that song's not on it. <laughs> <laughs> would would it know? be a stretch to say that some of you, at least what I thought, some of it was in, more in the vein of almost what Fate's Warning were doing? Um, well, I mean, you know, listen, when you have a singer like John Arch, no one is ever, you're, you're, without him, I mean, that guy sings in the most unique intervals in the world. Well, I'm actually a bigger um, fan of Ray Atlas, to tell you the truth. But. Well, listen, you know, he's a much more approachable singer. I mean, if you listen to John Arch and what he's done, we, we played with them many times in Connecticut. And I used to say, you sing, because he's a very reserved, quiet guy. It's hard to get to know, but a lovely person. He sings in, in uh, Eastern scale intervals. Mm -hmm. You know, like... Uh, you know, like notes we don't do here, like Islamic kind of, you know, call to prayer, Eastern scale motifs. Um, no, we don't do that in Western music. And without that in the band, their whole sound changed. I don't think they ever got commercial. Um, they but had they a couple got a... of albums that lean toward that, uh, like Should 89, they? 90, yeah, 88 to 91-ish. They, they leaned in that direction. Definitely. Uh, yeah. I, definitely more accessible. Yeah. Yeah. I must perfect, admit perfect to knowing symmetry. all the re I know all the records with John Arch, and I don't know any of the records of Ray Alder. Oh, okay. See, I'm a big Ray Ray Adler. Yeah, I, I liked I liked Archer. I, I never found those albums as great as everybody made them out to be. Personally, I loved Ray Adler and uh, have been a massive fan since he's in the band. I mean, those records that they did with John Arch are, if anything, extremely unique. Because of the way the it's it's oh, yeah. no one's ever played that kind of music before. It's very dissonant Eastern scale. It's uh, those melodies are impossible to do. I don't know. And then he did keep it true, and he sounded fantastic. Yeah, no, like, he wow. did. That, I, I will give him credit for that. He has definitely maintained his his vocal chops. I don't think he's sung at all in the last thirty years. He's, he's, That's he's probably a why. Carpenter, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> his voice he's a carpenter, is like a and he rides his yeah. yeah, he rides his bike all the time. We talked briefly uh, before we did keep it true because I, you know, I hadn't sung in a long time really. And I said, "What did you do?" And he said, "Oh, I went and had a throat scope." And uh, we talked about in ear monitors because mm -hmm. I was using those for the first time. Right. So he's a lovely guy. But yeah, I guess no. I think you know, Vivas Machina was born out of uh, fifty percent frustration and fifty percent inspiration. I think some of Hitman's best moments are on that record. I do Songs too. like, like I said, "Answer My Prayer," uh, words that sh that could have been a huge hit, and it's not. It, it's not a pandery commercial song. It doesn't sound like you know, uh, "Bed of Roses" or anything. It's it sounds like a classic rock song, um, and there's songs on there like "Listen" and "Mercy." I mean, that's. I'm really proud of some of the moments I on that album. I think it's a great album. I loved it when it came out. I thought it had great production. I loved yeah, Bob St. John, yeah, who we still work with. Terrific production. 
I like yeah. the booklet. I like the pictures of you guys, the, the way they did everything. Uh, they put, yeah, that they, was all done in house. Yeah, it was real, real big. T it, it had like a big time feel to it. The way it was produced, the way the booklet was put together, it yeah. it really looked like you guys were going places. But we had also, a top fashion photographer, James Styles, who had done Vogue and done GQ. This guy did incredible portraits. Well, that's how he posed you in that, in that uh, booklet. I think that was yeah. more my idea. Oh, was I just, it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was, you know, I was like, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, why not? You know, right? I'm not going to look like, you know, Bruce Dickinson, because I got tagged all the time that I look just like Bruce Dickinson on stage. I got that forever, because I had long red hair down to my ass. Right, right. You know, and then I, you know, I looked a lot like him. I don't sound like him, but I certainly move moved like him i got all of my stage moves and all of my dance training from mr dickinson so so would it be fair to say that this album did not do as well as you guys expected or were you it did it, it did better it did better okay it did better it it really did but not here we completely lost our audience here because grunge had happened but it's got a tremendous following in europe and people tell us all the time there was a point when we were getting all of our rights back, you know, we found that, that that record had actually sold much better than the first record. And people in Greece and Turkey and all these countries, we get Italy, we get all this fan mail. That's their favorite record. I have a, a guy that I'm friends with now on Facebook, and he's from Norway, and their favorite record is Vivas Machin. Mm. They're like, they like the first record, but they think it's derivative of, you know, Queensryche or Maiden or any of that stuff. They thought there was more originality on Vivas. And listen, mm. other than the few... Bon Jovi moments that were completely intentional, and I will take I'll take eighty percent of the blame for that because you know it's like hey I'm gonna give here's a I'm gonna give you a a, a chip and you're gonna be able to play virtuoso violin. Hmm. Are you gonna not do it? You know I discovered I could sing raspy. I won't do it now because it's it's really bad for your voice. But right. I, I found out that I could kind of do that raspy gritty rock sound pretty effectively and we decided to incorporate that into a couple of songs and it's really only three on that album so yeah. um, say a prayer for me which is actually a great song that's a great song uh, yeah it um, really is. yeah and we still haven't played any of that the shows that we played in europe since we got back together we have not played anything from that record and i think we should then there's the aforementioned terrible partners in crime and then there's the <laughs> the biggest offender of them all a song called renegade man which sounds like it should have been on bon jovi new jersey mm -hmm. yes <laughs> it's like whoa, whoa i'm a renegade yeah. man yeah that was <laughs> a... go where the wind goes right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's not a bad song. i really did, did not no it's a good song. song i should yeah. have sold it to john yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should have sold it. It would have been better. Well, so yeah, I, I look at that record. You know, we had to a lot of we had a lot of splaining to do, uh, and and the only uh, logical offer I have for anyone who gave a crap about this band is, it was it wasn't that we just decided to intentionally change our style. We had written a lot of more proggy stuff along the way, more hard rock. We had this great song called um, uh, My Last Confession that'll eventually find its way somewhere on, uh, I think we might put it on the re-release that we're going to do for Vivas eventually. Hmm. Um, we had a bunch of songs, a lot of cool songs that we had a, we had a, a suite. Uh, we had this, ca this kind of concept thing we were going to do, and we had some really cool song, Murder by Numbers, which was Polygram's favorite song of ours. We had written a lot of stuff, but by the time it got around to actually putting out a new record, we had new manager, and he had worked with, guess who, Bon Jovi mm. and Doc McGee, and he saw potential in record sales and the fact that I was kind of versatile at the time. And he said, yeah, you should pump that up. So it was partially his doing, management's doing. And I don't regret it. I think it was fun to do, and I like a lot of the songs. But I think it was a combination of our lawyer, our manager. We had a lot of people who had come over from the Doc McGee Bon Jovi camp. Wow. And they all knew how to make money. And, you know, at that point, we, you know, everybody's still working day jobs. Everybody really uh, was looking for a light at the end of the tunnel. So... That's how that happened. And I'll fall on that sword because, you know, it is what it is and it happened. So the but, new album is stuff well, that was yeah, in we're, the we're can. Yeah, we're going to jump 27 yeah. years ahead. Well, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of fill introduce us in, that in. But we're kind of going like with songwriting and everything. And we could talk more about all the mm -hmm. years in between. But 
the the new album is material that's relatively new or was it stuff that was in it's the can? all all new except for out in the cold is that the only one i, think there, I thought there cold. was two i thought i read there was oh two. code of honor code okay. of honor okay code of honor oh code of honor was a song that we wrote in between the first album and uh vivas machina oh okay that was the direction we were going in Completely in that more it's like Maiden meets Queensrÿch meets like a more progressive thing, a lot more instrumental, a lot more you know keyboards because I play keyboards and I played a lot of piano and keyboards on the Viva Smokin record, but it was more of a more prog kind of thing. So we were going in that kind of uh, in that direction, and it would have fit actually really well if we got rid of like Renegade Man and the, the, the horrible Partners in Crime. It probably would have been a great track for the Viva Smokin record, mm. and maybe would have given us a little bit more street cred. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, so the only, those were, all of those other songs on, on Destroy All Humans, uh, Jimmy and I wrote the year we record, we put that record out. Well, those are all new. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about that because like I said a second ago, it was it's 27 years, right, in between the last album and the new album, Destroy All, all Humans, which came out in 2020, right? Right in the right. middle of the pandemic, you guys put it out, right? So you, <laughs> we, we didn't again, mean right? to. <laughs> well, well, we had a problem. The record was done in the end of 2019 um, because we wanted to put that. We had written most of the stuff by the time we had played Keep It True, but we hadn't recorded it. We all have home recording studios, so we can all, you know, we can. Unfortunately, the days of going to the big studio and recording on two-inch tape with the big console, those days are over. Sure. But I'm I'm old enough to have known it. Yeah. And uh, I'm grateful for that. So we still kind of treat the studio as if it's a tape machine, and don't use a lot of the computer, you know plug-in crappery that mm -hmm. is wrecking records the compression and the, yeah, tu the tuning yeah. and the grid and all that crap that sucks the humanity out of records so we kind of treat it like that so jimmy you know wrote a bunch of songs i wrote a bunch of songs uh i got together with john and we wrote some stuff and we got uh you know jimmy lives in la uh, at that time you know chuck didn't play on on um it's australia humans so because him and jimmy got into a big tiff and uh you know that happens you know um some people uh jimmy is a very important part of hitman he's the guy that wrote metal sport and dead on arrival and backstreet rebels and is a is a curator and an architect of what hitman is mm -hmm. and other people seem to think that they are too and well, hey you know what? i was involved in some of those songs but i don't consider myself that sometimes you just have to take your ego out of the equation and realize what's best for the band that people like the band that people really love in him man is dead on arrival metal sport those songs caught in the crossfire those songs jimmy was the the architect of those things mm. so i'm lucky to to work with him i'm lucky to write with him yeah i get my own songs on records now too but it's a we we, we it's a it's a healthy competition and we make each other better um other guys in the band um chuck <laughs> thought he was a a much more important part of the puzzle but he wasn't a major writer mm. i mean he's a great drummer and and he is a part of the original hitman sound but you know if you had to pick you know if you had to do sophie's choice and you're at the the train car to auschwitz which one are you picking mm. i'm picking jimmy you know because that's the guy that's going to get the job done um yeah he's a great drummer but he just didn't see the light through the trees mm. and so he didn't play on that record so jimmy and i assembled most of that record John, you know, he he he's a very sensitive guy and he's one of the most beautiful people in the universe. He needs a little bit more prodding. He's not as prolific, but he comes up with great stuff when he does. And I kind of have to, you know, nudge him along. And when he does, it's great. And you love the assassin, which is my favorite song on that record, came from that. I caught him in a John lives here near me. So John and I, you know, we were able to stay great friends and like family. And uh, at that time, we were playing with a drummer named JS, who's a childhood friend of mine who played on uh, when I, I had a solo project. Yeah. yeah we're gonna, he played on that. Mention that in a second. <laughs> he played on that and uh, he played my live shows. And he's a guy that he played with us in Greece. Mm. He played the Athens show after Chuck decided to make his. <laughs> his very dramatic exit and um so i'm missing my point my point is you know like people just don't realize uh, you know where they fall on the uh, in the tree yeah and that's a shame because um 
you know i feel the essence of the band is was 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 definitely mike chuck jimmy john and myself mike's no longer with us it would have been great to have chuck on the record because we do sound like hitman more when he's yeah. playing you know mark played on vivas machina and he's back in the band now um it didn't work out for, with jay for some r very stupid reasons i'm lucky i'm still friends with the guy because that could have gone ugly too you know ego is a very dangerous thing it's it's important to have one but it's important to check it mm. when necessary yeah because listen yeah if you can't make fun of yourself you know you can't make fun of anybody else yeah you know i make fun of myself all the time so I, like yeah. i get to talk about joe and turner wigs and Ing van obstein <laughs> and slicing baloney and all the <laughs> More well, I, I do industry. too because I make fun of enough people, so I have to take pot shots. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't mean it in any kind <laughs> of mean way, too. but you know, there's no reason for anybody to be a douche. I've yeah. got a great. You want to hear a great douchey story? I'll just throw it in there because I love to digress. <laughs> so I've been bartending in New York City for a zillion years, right? As my day gig, so I am in I'm in, in this bar that I worked in for a really long time, and I'm about to leave, and my fellow bartenders, lovely girls, about to take on the shift, and who walks in the door? but john bush so uh i do you guys like armored saint i, I, I love, love uh, armored saint. it's one of my <laughs> okay. top 10 favorite bands there you go so i i like armored saint a lot and i especially love raising fear i love that album. yeah me too so he comes in and i'm like hey john bush and he kind of gives me this look and i'm like um hey we have a couple of things in common and he said which are and i said you're in anthrax now and i was like one of the first singers in anthrax he said, okay. Hmm. And I said, and also we opened up for you a couple of times at Sundance on Long Island. He was so not interested oh, at wow. all. Really? So not interested. Uh, so this was he when was, he was in Anthrax? or This is when he was in Anthrax. This is quite was, a while. Okay, this is going This back is probably like 98, 99, yeah, like 20 whenever he was in right. Yeah. And um, I was leaving, but I said to her, make sure that they have no check you know take care of him i said listen she's gonna take great care of you it's nice to meet you blah 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 i've always been a fan great he's a great singer absolutely he's a monster wow. singer yeah, tremendous. monster singer so uh she calls me up about 10 o'clock because she's irish she's from ireland she goes what the fuck's up with your friend there man and what do you mean she goes fucking hell, they rang up about 350 dollars and he left me fuck all he didn't really? tip her. Wow. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I hate to hear that. <laughs> yeah. So he, him and his gang, I think he was with, uh, he was with, I think he was with one of the guys from Armored Saint at the time. I think he was with G Gonzo. Okay. I wouldn't know those guys if they gang raped me in a park. Well, but, they were all from East LA, those guys. So that might explain a lot. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. But I mean, whatever. That's my John Bush story. That's I digress. interesting, though. I was hoping to be like, a cheerleader. Great so, singer, yeah. great singer, bad tipper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he is. He he is a great singer. I saw him a couple of years ago when they did that big comeback tour where they uh, did the full out, that one of their albums, like in their entirety. Then they came out and played all their hits. And he's incredible. I mean, the the energy that guy puts forth on stage and the vocal Yeah, no, he's, he's a machine. He's a yeah, machine. Yeah, he really We is. played with them in, uh, at, uh, in Athens. Okay. Uh, 2019, March 2019, we played the Up the Hammers Festival, which was really fun. They played the night before. Boy, Athens is some place. I it really keeps a lot of bands. Like the huge into Fates Warning, Ahmed Saint, um, Hitman, all all that type of Crimson Glory. Crimson Glory. In fact, we have like <laughs> a contingency Glory. of guys that follow the podcast that that private message me and are always asking me who's coming on and you know they they like the 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 edgy power metal stuff you know they're all sure well yeah which is the that's really where we come from power yeah. metal yeah yeah well, oh that was another band that i that approached me a long time ago after midnight kicked the bucket oh really Real? oh that's interesting because we, yeah, we had ben jackson on not too long ago yeah and i don't know who was somebody who was managing them and they were from greece and it was through facebook and i believe it was it might have been after it wasn't that long ago. It was a couple of years ago. I don't know if it was before Latori or after Latori. Well, well, they played in Greece. It was one of the last shows Midnight did. They did a couple of shows in Greece with Midnight, and he was oh. a little he was a little rough because he he hadn't really been active. And, okay. And did, then they came happen? back years after that with with Latori and, and played in Greece also. If I if, if I'm correct. Yeah. He's one of the nicest people I've ever met. In my he he life. seems like it. I mean, I've seen him live with Queens. Like right? he's very impressive. Also, really, we impressive. just played with them. Oh, really? We played Peekskill with them. 
Interesting. Yeah. April April third. Well, let's talk about shows. What what is is Hitman doing? I know you guys, and I'll be seeing you uh, actually in October uh, in New Jersey when you open up for Accept. But what's right. on the uh, what's on the schedule for Hitman? Those are kind of one offs because the the whole point of playing it's so hard to play here. Um, there's so much political crap that goes on with trying to get these gigs booked. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody thinks they're doing you a colossal favor by allowing you to play. And I'm like, you know, I can play in Europe and everyone knows all the lyrics to my songs. So thank yeah. you very much. Right. You know, I, I like playing. I like playing to the fans that want to hear it. But like when I hear promoters telling me that they're doing us a big favor, it leaves a very uh, mm. bad taste in my mouth. I mean, first time, maybe. Second time, maybe not. Yeah. Third time, I'm just the moron. <laughs> but um, so uh, that show was fun as hell, but only because I had n- I did not know what to expect. Obviously, we played a lot of songs from from Destroy All Humans. People don't know them, but the crowd was pretty cool. Queens right couldn't have been nicer. Toddler Tour is the sweetest guy. He watched the whole show from my side of the stage. He was handed me water. He was the sweetest, most complimentary, loveliest guy ever. <laughs> Um, I'd, I'd love to do more stuff like that. Um, I don't know. Uh, we're going to be playing with Accept. That's the guy from TT Quick, right? So yes. those should oh, be yeah. fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, he's a great singer. Uh, that should be a lot of fun. I hope that we're playing Peak Skill again. I think you have three uh, three shows. Uh, yeah, the three shows in a row. Yeah. Yeah. One's on Long Island. One's uh, in Peak Skill, and Jersey. the other one's in Jersey. In Jersey, that's where I'll be seeing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, th- those are kind of one-offs because we're in the middle of finishing writing this new record and a lot of, we've got a good chunk of it recorded we just have to fix a lot of stuff i mean it's not going to come out until probably late fall winter but uh we definitely have a new record coming oh, wow. and we actually have two jimmy and i have been working on two records one of them is kind of more of a straight up uh hitman record mm-hmm. you know it's like more of like what we should everybody's always said we should be playing okay. and that we enjoy playing. And then we've got a much more conceptual thing uh, happening that we're also writing for. Like I'll write a song or Jimmy, I'll write a song. We'll be like, Oh, that's good for this one. And that one's good for that one. And then we'll tailor it lyrically um, because we've been pretty quick about writing. Interesting. We, got a, wow. we have a lot of songs. So I said, Hey, since we, we are able to do it, as long as it's not total garbage, let's just record as much as we possibly can and just divvy it up. Because we know what uh, uh, now after after mulling over what songs are going to go on Destroy All Humans. And believe me, there was a lot. Uh, we we knew that we had some work to do, and that record had to have a much more classic Hitman feel. So we intentionally made sure that we didn't make any of the mistakes we made on Viva Smock and we we wrote and recorded a straight up kind of hitman record so we're going to do uh, another record hopefully even better than that but we also have some very experimental stuff that you know Jimmy and I both play a bunch of stuff he's a really he's a multi faceted guy and uh, sometimes you know he's got this unbelievable band i don't know if you know about it he's he plays he, he writes and records and leads a, 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 a Luxotica band, an Exotica band, where it's like this kind of um, Southeast Asian, Polynesian music hmm. with wow. crazy instrumentation. And he tours all over the West Coast and wow, Hawaii really cool. and all these places. Huh. And so he's a very versatile guy. And uh, I'm not saying we're going to do that. We're yeah. not. But right. <laughs> we're not going to do any laka 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 tiki yaki. We're not going to do that. <laughs> but... Um, you know, no it, Don Ho. We don't want to hear Don there's Ho. There's no Don Ho. <laughs> uh, you, but you know, you could pull he, that off with a with a good power chord. I think you could pull that off. His, I mean, the, the the stuff that he does on those records is outrageously great. I mean, it's like as if imagine that style of music done by like a guy that really loves hard rock and prog. Right, it's right. like really melodic. You know, he plays vibes and xylophone and he plays so many different wow. instruments. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we just decided, you know, the the this the next sort of hitman record we're planning is going to be more of a straight up hitman affair and then we're, we're also writing songs that are going to lend itself well to more orche- orchestral things you know something with more of an orchestral vibe to it and that's you know all musicians want to jerk off to themselves because uh, they've got a string section on their record you know because yeah. we we all want to do the you know uh, the michael Kamen yeah. angle and, right. and have that done 
Uh, now, will this be on, I, on uh, No Remorse also, the new record? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> uh, TBD. Okay. Uh, yeah, we okay. had a very nice relationship with them. Uh, we like those guys very much. There's a very strange thing that's gone on in Europe with us, and it's like th- there's a lot of festivals, and we haven't been invited to any of them. And I don't know what that is. Um, you know, like we kind of we show up and we play pretty good, and we're nice enough fellas. Uh, I don't know if they have a backlog of, of festivals, but we're dying to do the festival circuit over there, and we're trying to figure out. We were told that there's a lot of pay to play there. To play like Vakken yeah, and yeah. all of those kind of festivals. But like I look at the bill and I'm like, I don't know who that is. And I don't know who that is. And I don't know who that is. No. So when are they going to ask us? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and there's I not too many know. bands I see on those bills either. That I see There's, there's the pay. big headliners right. and then you got the really Yeah, smart you got Iron Maiden, Rozzy, mm-hmm. your Judas yeah. Priest, and then... Saxon the dirt, plays the, a lot the, of them too. Yeah, Saxon, the Dirty Toilet Boys plus, yeah. you know... Right. All this, I mean, I never heard of any of these bands. Right. Yeah. So... We're we're not quite sure if that's because of what label we're on, or we don't. You know, we're not on mm. Frontiers or SPV yeah. or any of those record well, labels. Well, I can tell you if, if you listen to them, Walk Bowls. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you don't want to be on Frontiers. Frontiers ain't yeah. doing shit for you in the way you're touring. And I've heard that from other musicians too. Well, they turned us down cold anyway. Did they? Yeah. yeah. Well, that goes to show you. I mean, they they just pump out a lot of stuff that kind of is more cookie cutter than you guys are. You know, I, I yeah. I, well, I they, they do a lot of poser. They way. probably put out the new House of Lords or something like right. that. Right. I would actually yeah. take that as a compliment if they turned you down because they did. Uh, you, they did. The record you guys put out a couple of years ago is ten times better than anything that label has put out in ten years. So um, well, there. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that's, you know, that's coming from you the know, heart. We, we, thank you very much. We almost wound back uh, back up on SPV because all the evil people are gone. Mm. And a guy we really, really like runs that label, this guy, Ali Han. He's, I love that guy. And we had a great relationship with him. And right as we were finishing the record, he I played it for him. And he's like, all right, we'll offer you a deal. And it was okay. But the deal that we got through No Remorse was far more flexible. We own all of our streaming. So they put out the vinyl and the CDs. And by the way, the vinyl sells way better than the, CD, the CDs do. Nobody buys CDs in Europe. They buy vinyl. And so that's why we did the, uh, you know, the big gatefold and put a little bit more uh, effort into the vinyl. So we had a better deal with them, you know, not financially, but uh, effectively down the line, it would be more rewarding for us. So and it worked out very well, and they're very nice. Is a guy named Chris, and he runs that out of his record shop in Athens. Hmm. And the I love the Greek people. I would love to continue a relationship with them because I think they're great. Playing there was astonishing. It's a, one of the most beautiful countries I've I had I've been at a lot of places I had never been there. It was one of the most wonderful, uh, mesmerizing historic cities I've ever seen, and uh, the food and the people. It was just magical. Yeah. I loved every second of it, and the, the fans were incredible. They were incredible. It was even better super than yeah. Keep It True, which was our first gig back, and that was really, really super scary to do that. And Chuck yeah. played that. Well, okay. At least we got that done. Mm-hmm. At least he got to play that show, and it so, went very well. So, what was the deal with the uh, the Flexi single with "No Time to Die"? I had to go out and buy that, and have my friend Mark here put it <laughs> you on. You should have just wait. You should have just waited or called me, and I would have just sent you one. Well, I, I didn't know you. <laughs> um, well, that was one of the songs that Jimmy wrote that just didn't sound like Hitman. Mm-hmm. And it was before the James Bond movie came out, before anybody had known the title. He came up with that title. Oh. And it was not a very hitman sounding song. Uh, you know, we recorded it, um, and it just didn't sound like Hitman at all. Yeah, you know, it's a pretty it good song, like though. A, I thought the song itself is, is good. It sounds like a, something that could have been on, like, stained class. Yes. It sounds pre, it very does, priesty. Does, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's very got a lot of KK whammy bar on it. It sounds like it sounds like old priest, and Hitman has never sounded like Judas Priest. We've sounded like a lot of people, but we've never sounded like no, Priest. No, you definitely so, did not. Yeah, I mean, Jimmy was disappointed that it didn't make the record. But listen, I I wrote about ten songs that didn't make that record either. Okay. So I'm, I'm like, so hey, <laughs> you know. Uh, but it, we recorded it, so we decided to just throw it out there on the on, on the flexi disc for fun, and people liked it. 
It's not yeah, a bad that's, song. That's I think it's a good song. Because, yeah, I think it's a great song. Great song, just not a, not yeah, flexi discs are fun, right? Yeah, yeah I want to do more of that there. stuff. Yeah. You used to get them in your cereal. Right. Or, yeah, on like, the back uh, of the box. I don't know how old That's you right. are, but on the back of the box, oh, I'm you old enough to, to remember them. Believe me, yeah. <laughs> Sugar Smacks. <laughs> Do you know what? I have two boxes of Quisp on the top of my refrigerator. Oh, Quisp. That's Quisp. Awesome. They don't make it no more. I think. No, they, you, do. they do. You, you they can do. buy it oh, online. You find it. Yeah, you oh, we gotta buy it, it online. Okay. Yeah, you I, buy I it from stores. Oh yeah. You buy it from Quaker online. It's awesome. That's where I got it. I I ate one box of it, and the rest of it. Your teeth fell out. <laughs> no, it, I have two boxes that I bought like four years ago. They're in plastic, sealed ah. in plastic. It's a museum piece now because I would never eat that. <laughs> oh, I be ate horrible. It. I ate it, but yeah, it's like it's like a pile of sugar. <laughs> it's like Captain Crunch without the mouth sores, right? <laughs> right. Because <laughs> Captain Crunch just makes your mouth bleed. <laughs> right. So I got, I have one one request for you. This is my request. Yeah. Would you guys reissue that first T-shirt from the first album? Is there any possibilities of that? You mean with the album cover? Yes. I think we've done that. Have you? How did I miss it? I'm a big collector of vintage T-shirts. I could never find that shirt, the original one. Uh, did we not sell that at, in Greece? Oh, I well, think that we, might have been how I missed it. <laughs> I think we... I, I, will, I will check on that. I Take one I off for that, me, will you? I'm an extra large. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sure that we did. Really? But but with the fixed cover, not the shitty first one. We fixed it. <laughs> but, but it had the artwork of the first album. With, with the well, plate yeah. yeah. Well, but the whole thing was completely redone. Right. Yeah. By the same guy who did all the sketches on the inside of Vivas Machina. Paul oh. Stipkovich. Oh. The same guy who did all that beautiful artwork that you love on that album is the guy that completely fixed the first album. Because we had a guy that Chuck knew... And he did a kind of half-ass um, airbrush job, mm -hmm. and uh, like the the target wasn't aligned. You could see that the the plastic overlay wasn't correct and was photographed badly. So when we went in and remastered that album, we decided to completely redo. It's the same cover, just completely redone. It's not just the diamond plate; it's all the pictures. Are oh, yeah, all the pictures you know. are totally sharper, clearer. Yeah. 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 It's completely new paintings. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but if you look Pretty on cool. your Facebook page, there's somebody that has a picture up there of the original shirt from the eighties. Well, I don't know if I could get you that per se, but no, I might no, be I'm able not to that, get you I, whatever. I, yeah, but whatever I, we got. I, I always I, had. I know that, that we did. Okay, yeah. Dig, dig around. For me. I'll dig around. I'll, if I find one, I'll absolutely throw that in the post. <laughs> well, well, for well, sure excellent well well Dirk, I, I we would be remiss if we didn't talk about it because we've talked about you know hitman and and everything even the you know your anthrax time and all that stuff but, yeah, yeah. but but let's let's before we go let's just talk about your solo album um life is now and 2011 that came out so it's a while ago now but i, I understand that's something that that took many years to kind of even happen right it, it was a long well, time coming I have always had a studio in my house. I've, I've, I've always had one and I, you know, wasn't in Hitman anymore and I wasn't not in Hitman cause we never broke up. We kind of just stopped working. Right. That's what I um, hate but I was, yeah. I was doing a lot of uh, music for TV and voiceovers and I was, you know, writing jingly stuff, oh, but I was one of those always, guys. we've had, we've had yeah. a bunch of guests that did Dave Bickler from survivors done that. Uh, yeah. Who else? Was that? But meanwhile, I, I'm yeah. still the guy that always kept a day job though. Okay. I always did. Okay. So I got all of my musician friends are all home getting stoned and <laughs> like getting up late. And I was always the guy that, you know, tended bar. Yeah. Uh, I, I've always had a day job. I've always had one um, because I like job security. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know how some people do it. They've never had jobs. They just, you know, scrounge around. I can't be that guy, man. I just can't. Yeah. I can't do it. I can't be that guy. Um, so, yeah, that was. um that was uh, a labor of love. I recorded it uh, in my home studio. Uh, I had a, I have a friend, a uh, um, college superstar, mm -hmm. who's uh, one of the most – he was a Hitman fan, and he's one of the most talented people I've ever known in my entire life. And he's the funniest fucker ever. And talk about the best, m craziest Kiss fan ever. So we would just sit here and be Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons, and we would just <laughs> record stuff. And we did it over the course of you know like four years – and then I, then I sat on it for a while. And this was and your guitar I, player you're talking about. 
this was the guy that played most of the lead guitar on that record yeah. and i co-wrote a couple of those tunes with it was just exploring another side of the music that i listened to because i'll be honest with you uh, i don't listen to a whole lot of metal i did when i was young but like i like you know people say that they're the song destroy all humans reminded that somebody said oh it sounds like dungeons are calling from sabotage and i will tell you right now i never heard it I don't. I never listened to that band. I don't know any. The only thing I knew is I met Paul O'Neill a long, long time ago, mm -hmm. and uh, he was like putting together the beginning, I think, of TSO or something with Sabotage, yeah. and I auditioned for him a long, long time ago. He lived in Jackson Heights, oh, but yeah. I never really listened to Sabotage. I don't, I'm, I'm not up on you a lot of that. You never listened to the Dungeons of Calling? No, I don't. I never heard that oh, song. My I've God. heard it now. <laughs> I know. I heard. It. Some, you know, I'm like I listen to Kate Bush and Peter Gabriel, and okay. well, that's I what like I was um, say. the solo album has. It's got the Queen, it's got a little Pink Floyd. It's yeah, got Kate I mean Bush, Queen, obviously. Yeah. Like Queen sold their soul now, so I, I hate saying they're my favorite band. They yeah. always were my favorite band, but now it's like Fried Chicken or you know, um, you know, uh, Vibrators that don't stop me now. Yeah, they they they've sold their licensed their music to everybody. Yeah, and that movie was so fake. That movie was awful. It was <laughs> you god know? awful. They, you know, listen, Freddie painful. Mercury was the greatest rock singer ever, the greatest frontman ever. He was all those things, and he was a genius. Yeah. But he loved to do blow and go, you know, fuck a lot of dudes in dungeons all over New York City, yeah, and no, do crazy I know. shit, I know. and go to the mine shaft and do all that kind of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And now he's like a Disney character. Yeah, unfortunately. He's become like the guy, there's a statue of him, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, because they just put this this movie out that was so the timeline was all wrong and, mm -hmm. um like they acted as if like live aid he's got aids and he's gonna do live aid and he's gonna give the world's greatest tour de force performance even struggling he didn't have it he didn't know he had that yet mm. he didn't know it's for years later that's right and they did the magic tour years later so like that was that's, it was so um, deceptive to me, yeah. and I've said as enjoyable as a film as it was, and it was enjoyable. Rami Malek did a great job, and that guy who played Brian May was unbelievable. Um, but it was fiction, and it was yeah, not for was Queen true. fans. It was for the public. It was yeah. for John Q. Public. You know, oh, I like Queen. It's like the same people <laughs> who say I love ABBA and yeah. the Bee Gees. You know, but when you're a rabid Kiss fan or a Queen fan or whatever Iron Maiden fan, you know everything. Right. And I know everything about Queen. And I'm like, nope, 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 that's wrong. Nope, that's wrong. That's fake. Nope. It, it ruined the movie for me because I knew half of it was worse. Well, you know what they're trying to do that now with Phil Lynott also. Um, they're, they're trying oh, to. Are they? Yeah. They, I mean, there's been a load of documentaries and uh, autobiographies that had a guy that played him in a movie. They just did a, a, a movie with his daughter and his wife were behind it. And they've tried to soften the guy that he was too with the artist he was and kind of make him more, more mainstream and downplay the drug addiction and all the other demons that he had. Um, it, it reminds me a lot of what, what they did with Mercury also. Now, did you see the rocket man movie? No, no. Well, guess what? Tons of blow, mm -hmm. tons of gay sex, tons of Elton doesn't give a shit. So it's more, Elton, it's more authentic. He, he, it was, a th it was, it was so beautifully done that movie. It was kind of like a dream sequence where the guy would break into song. It was like a musical. Oh, okay. It was fantastically engineered this film and warts and all, man, because Elton does not give a fuck. I gotta watch it then because I I know it did get good reviews. I was never really a big Elton John. It's fan. a much better. Oh really? Yeah, I don't I mean, see I, how that's possible. I, I didn't dis. I never disliked them, but I just I don't know. Maybe it was I grew up in that early to mid seventies era when all these bands. You know, I was so taken up with Purple and Sabbath and Zeppelin, sure, well, Johnny yeah. Winter, the, 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 Tull. You know, I that. There wasn't really a place for Elton John in my life, you know, so it never really resonated yeah. with me. But I don't. It would, it would have. It would probably have had to happen like it happened for me. So, I, like I told you earlier, I was into Partridge Family, and then my sister got me Elton John's Greatest Hits, mm -hmm. which I think came out in like '73. Yeah. She gave it to me in like '76, yeah. and it had like all the you know don't let the sun go down on me and your song and take me to the pilot and all these great songs so my young young minds no, like, i love great all this songs stuff. No so i've been a it. lifelong i saw him in central park i've seen him so many times but hey you mentioned deep purple and i forgot uh, i think you guys would enjoy a little ian gillen story absolutely um so uh so we played the cat club in like 1989 or 1990 
And um, this was like, I think, when Hitman was at our best, you know. Um, we looked great. We sounded great. And it was like the, the probably the era where we were really on fire. And um, Don Hill was this famous guy that ran the Cat Club. Yeah. And he later owned his own club called Don. He was the greatest guy. He's passed away. And he was really a guy that looked after local New York artists and uh, nurtured them and really tried to make an impact in people's lives. Mm -hmm. So we used to get to play there all the time. And we got, I saw the Dan Reed network and darling cruel and all these great, there was a great band called, are you ready? And so one night we play the show and the lead singer from, are you ready? was introduced us and his name was Patrick mm -hmm. and him and I were like nemesis, nemesis. Yeah. Um, cause we were both like at that point, I think I weighed like a hundred pounds and he weighed a hundred pounds and we were both skinny redheads and we were both super pretty. And, uh, we were like vying for the same kind of spotlight. And they were, they were touted to be like the next big, uh, signed band. And then they, they got into the MCA machine. If I'm not correct. And, that, uh, wow, you're nowhere. absolutely right. Yeah. They went nowhere. You remember them. And yep. uh, the, it was Patrick Briggs and Jeff Grayson on guitar and, uh, Koji on, on mm -hmm. bass. Cool. Great, great funk band. Funky, like the yeah. Dan Reed network. Yep. Yeah. But rock and great band. And so, and they actually recorded an album for MCA right before we went into the same studio to record Vivas Machina. Mm -hmm. And I still to this day have never heard the record. Oh, wow. Really? But I guarantee you, I would know every word to every one of those yeah. songs because I went to all their shows. So we played this show and it was a good set. And I believe it's on YouTube somewhere. If you look up Hitman Cat Club, there's a show. And so Don Hill comes back. He goes, Hey, Dirk, uh, do you like Deep Purple? And I said, uh, uh, yeah, he goes, do you like Ian Gillen? And I'm a huge, 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 huge Jesus Christ Superstar fanatic. Okay. And uh, there's only one uh, Jesus for me, and that's Ian Gillen. That's where, he got, he, that's where he got discovered from, yeah. Yeah, and that's like the greatest thing, one of the greatest things he ever did. And then they made a movie, and he turned it down. They offered it to him, he turned it down. So he goes, he loved the show, and he'd like to come backstage and say hello. And I went, get out of here. He's what like, was, yeah, he, he's what was he doing there? <laughs> Wow. Him and Roger Glover decided to go out have for drinks and see a band. Wow. They just wandered into the club. Interesting. Wow. So, you know, I'm like 20 years old or 21. I live with my parents. And he comes backstage and we get on like a house on fire. And like, I've never been, I've never done any drugs. You know, I'll, you know, I'll drink a little bit. but I've never done any drugs or anything like that in my life to this day. And um, he wants to go out and party. <laughs> <laughs> He's like... We got on the house right. He's like, you know what your problem is, mate? You got monitors. You gotta get rid of the monitors. It's it's what's in your head. You <laughs> don't need the monitors. Get rid of it. You got you goes, you've got a radio mic and he goes, You don't need any of that shot. You just gotta get behind, get a cord and a mic and just listen to your head. And I'm like, oh my God, Ian Gillen says I should do this. Yeah. I'm going to get rid of my wireless microphone. I'm going to get rid of my monitors. I never did any of that. <laughs> so we go out and he proceeds to just become the wildest person in the entire world. That's what he was known wow. for. Partying his brain That's death, disappearing to the men's room every 10, 15 yeah. minutes. Crazy shit. Yeah. He winds up disappearing. <laughs> so I go home and the next morning I get a call from ian gillen but i'm asleep and my sister who's 10 years older than me picks up the phone and she's an, an enormous <laughs> deep purple fan and she goes there's a guy on the phone who says he's ian gillen and i told him to go fuck himself and i hung up <laughs> and i went pat no it really was. it's ian gillen she goes fuck off and i said i hung out with him all night and i lost him somewhere i don't know where he went she goes what were you doing hanging around with Ian Gillen? I said, yeah. he came to the Cat Club show and he really liked the band and we hung out. And and I had I had a couple of beers, beers too many that night too. So I said, I lost him. So he calls back and she picks up the phone. And she hands it to me. He goes, mate, you got to you gotta call my wife in, in England and you have to tell her I spent the night with you. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And he goes, her name is Bron and she's looking for me all over new york and i'm i'm fucked i'm dead i'm a dead mate i'm dead and you gotta call her here's the number and i have i have my philo facts this day with me scribbling down ian killen's home number and he was like call her up and go listen bron this is dirk from a band called hitman and i just spent 
listen, your husband, he's sat down on my couch and he's completely lit up like a Christmas tree. I can't rouse him. <laughs> and I'll have him call you when he gets up because she's going to think I've knackered off, buggered off with some birds. And I don't want, it just can't fucking happen. <laughs> so I call Ian Killen's <laughs> wife and I totally told her a bullshit story That's and then great. that night he comes and he picks me up and we go and do it again oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> that's great oh, and i think i lied for her like and at that point she's like she calls my parents and says, is he that uh is he is he is he sacked on the couch again i'm like i can't keep up with him braun i don't know i don't the guy is just an animal she has a lot of experience <laughs> Oh my god! But you know so the story really about him is that's how he ended up in Black Sabbath. Uh, yes, he doesn't remember saying yes to. <laughs> no, but it's in every book other than in his own book. He says he doesn't remember that. But <laughs> I read Giza Butler said it. Tony Iommi said it. That trash. Yeah, yeah. They they got totally wasted, and they were. And he agreed to do it. And the next day, said he had no recollection of agreeing to play in Black Sabbath. So my, he, my question is because I'm such a voice pussy, like ooh, ooh, it's gonna hurt my voice. That guy. And he got, we went to some karaoke bar. <laughs> I don't, and he got up and he sang Smoke on the Water. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> and course. he was nuts. And I was like fast friends with Ian Gillen for like two weeks of my life. Wow. And then that was the end of it. It was like I had a brief affair with Ian Gillen. Did wow. you ever hear the fantastic. album, the That's Ian great. Gillen band Glory Road? Oh, man, are you kidding me? I love him. I, of course I am. That is better than most of the Deep Purple albums. That is one of the, my all-time favorite albums. It's Bernie Torme on that record? Bernie Torme is on it. John McCoy, yeah. Yeah, it's great stuff. Yeah. But you know what? Um, if somebody, and I heard of rumblings that this might happen, somebody, God, please, will go in there and remix uh, Born Again, because it's a great album. I could never get past the sound of it. It's so bad. It it's sounds so like awful. It, was, it, was, it sounds like it was recorded in the toilet Ian just threw up in. Yeah. yeah. And I, it's I, so bad. I had a hard time accepting him in Sabbath, but it was easy for me not to like it when I heard the record. And to this day, I, it's never warmed up to me. Yeah. Well, I think it was talked about that they are going to try and do something with yeah, this. I mean, I, 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 yeah. I read that. I read that it, Tony said that he finally got a hold of the master tapes and he was going to, I hope that, you know, don't mix it yourself. Get yeah. somebody great. Absolutely. Unfortunately, yeah. Martin Birch is no longer alive. Right, no, absolutely. Yeah. And don't get, don't get, uh, oh, that guy's record sucks. Don't suck. get the guy who's uh, been doing Iron Maiden either. Yeah, it's just Shirley, <laughs> Kevin Shirley. Kevin Shirley, yeah. Those are, you want to know what? I love Iron Maiden. Like, I really want to open for them, and I don't want to badmouth them because if it ever gets around to them, I'll say something disparaging, and they'll be like, fuck that guy. <laughs> but you make an album called The Book of Souls, and you're, you have, you're, you know, you're worth $350 million. Can you hire a piano player and an orchestra instead mm -hmm. of like the MIDI piano and the MIDI keyboards on that record? Like, yeah, and I like that. I like that album a lot, but again, I did too. It, I don't it, like it, Empire of the Clouds. That's a very sad thing. I think that's not a great song. Yeah, that's probably the weakest song. On it's the meow. Album. Yeah, but uh, yeah, there was some meow. really good things on it. But again, it had a a real flat production. But that's Kevin Shirley. Yeah. But Kevin Shirley, uh, he's a hero to me for one thing. I hate PRS guitars, and if I see anybody playing them, I'll walk out of the room or I'll just turn the channel because they're garbage. They sound like mud, and they're just coffee tables. They're just mm. pretty pieces of wood that sound like shit. And there's this thing when, like, I don't know if it was the guy in Alter Bridge or any of those really crappy uh, those of bands. 90s yeah. bands that, bands you know. Those bands that come out with the Nickelbacky yep. whatever crap. Yeah, they all you know, and they all, all their guitar players all have Paul They Reese all have that guitars. sound, yeah. And you can't make those sounds. Anyway, Alex Lifeson was playing PRS for a very short period of time. And there's a video on YouTube where Kevin Shirley's like, oh, yeah, and he's, he's from South Africa. And he's like, yeah, I was going to remix something that they did. And uh, it was time for him to do some solos. And the guy shows up with a guitar, and I go, what's that, Alex? He goes, it's my PRS. I'm going to play some solos. He goes, not in my fucking studio. Throw that piece <laughs> of shit out and go get a Les Paul like a real man. Uh -huh. Get that fucking piece of balsa wood out of Absolutely. here. Absolutely. <laughs> and he said he pulled the guitar out of his hand and gave him a Les Paul. And you know what? Alex Lesson's played Les Pauls ever since. That's something nice. There was that period of really shit. Russ has never made a shitty record to me. I'm a huge fan. But there was that period where it was kind of glossy. 
Oh yeah. And those 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 guitars are just pretty crappy. But I do not like any of Kevin Shirley's records. However, I found that he is the guy responsible for Celebration Day, which is the Led Zeppelin uh, concert. Yes. In fact, that that, that, sound, that he made good. he made his name through that a lot. That really put him. Wow. Through, yeah. It's pretty good. Yeah. So I, I, I think I, you know I don't get the last couple of productions by him with Maiden, and I like both of those their last two studio albums. The, yeah, the, no, the, the, I mean, the production the is really flat, really flat. Um, my problem was on Book of Souls is like, did he instruct Bruce that there will be absolutely no background vocals whatsoever on that? Well, record? that's another thing, too. There's there's no background vocals on, on the whole. There's some album. on Sinjutsu, but right. Like, what's the first song on on the uh, Book of Souls? Is it something about the speed of light? Well, no, the, no, if, if Eternity Should Fail. It, it, oh, which I love. That's a One of the greatest songs. modern Maiden songs of all Absolutely. time. But I would be like on the subway and I'd be going like, and the title should fail. Yep. I'd be singing the third on there because right. I was like, that's what's missing mm, that's from what's this. That's what's missing, yep. I yep. was like, why is there no production on these? Why did the drums sound so, uh, so uh, dry and shitty? You know, because Martin Birch was a production god. Well, Martin Birch records, made, made that guy sound decent. Even when, you know, back in the... I was I've never been a big Nico McBrain fan. I, I like Clive Burr a lot, a lot better. Me too. Did you get to see them a couple of times with Clive? I did. I never saw them with Clive Burr. No, I did not. I saw them with Deanna on the Killers tour. Oh, wow. No, I didn't. I and didn't. then I saw them on The Number of the Beast many, many, many times. I actually went to the North Stage Theater to see Maiden, The Rods, and I forget who else. And I went with Scott Rosenfeld. We went together. Yeah, really? To that show. Because that's around the time I was goofing around with those guys. Um, yeah, I mean, Martin Birch, think about the records he did. He did Heaven and Hell and the Marb Rules. He did Rainbow Rising and Long Live Rock and Roll. I mean, these are some of the best records I've ever owned in my life. Were all done by Martin Birch. And then he did all those those early, you know, The Number of the, the Killers, The Number of the Beast, Peace of Mind. Those records sound incredible. And he, and he did the two great, the two greatest Rainbow records ever made. And yeah. although I was you know, never a big fan of the the way Rainbow Rising sounded, it had it had no bass in it at all. The bottom supposedly Blackmore was behind filtering out a lot of the bass on on that album. But if you listen to it, I'll have to go back. I, maybe I'm just so completely. Yeah, uh, it's. I mean, because the drum sound on that record is drum sound was the great. Best uh, drum sound yeah, ever. Absolutely, recorded. Uh, all of the stuff that that Cozy was on, he, he didn't shortchange him. But he's my favorite drummer of all time. He's. he's He's in my top three. He's, yeah, who are your top three? Uh, <laughs> it's it's cliche, but it's just what I grew up. John with. Bonham, Ian Pace, and uh, Cozy Powell. Those are the three best rock drummers there ever. That's were. what I think so, too. Well, that's I agree hundred percent because Ian Gillen, Ian Pace is the most underrated drummer ever. Absolutely, in history. complete beast. You know, yeah. and uh, our drummer Mark Jenkins, that you know, that played on Vivas and plays with us again. Uh, his favorite drummer is Ian Pace. And he, he, we end songs that there's a thing that he, that Deep Purple do. At the end of the song goes, uh, and we end songs with that. And I make them do it all the time because I just want to hear it. <laughs> and, you know, all of those guys were jazz trained. That's what really set them all of apart. them. Yeah. All of them. They're they, all. Right. I mean, they had jazz chops. Classical and jazz right. chops. Yeah. Right. Well, um, Derek, I mean, I think, you know, I'm, I'm looking here at our clock. Actually, my clock went off because we've been talking so long. But I think I think we're going to have to make this a two-parter, right, yeah, Tom? You, you've I think set, we, you, you've set, set a, a Jersey guy's record. It's also been one of our, maybe our most entertaining podcasts. Yeah. Oh, come on now. I, no, I, I can talk a God. dog off a meat truck. I, I swear to God. <laughs> no, this was good. This is great. Uh, a lot of laughs. I mean, really good stuff. So, But, uh, you know, hey, uh Derek, uh, Derek, we really appreciate the time here tonight. Oh, it was, um, it was so much fun, man. Thank you know, you everybody, so Derek Kennedy, Hitman. Um, and we'll see you album. in November, October. 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 We'll see we'll you in see October. You I'll tell you, you guys going to come to the... Which yes, because we both live in Jersey. So I'm going to be at the Jersey be, show. The Jersey, Jersey show, guys yeah. at the Jersey do, do show. Do you know this club that I'm a, yeah, playing? Yes, De Debonair Music Hall. It's an awesome... <laughs> it's a small club. I think it's a small club, but he thinks it's a small club. Well, how many seats are in there? I think it holds about 300. At the most. That's intimate. Yes, very intimate. Wow. It's great great it's sound a, system, nice stage. A, we yeah. should do an acoustic show. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> nah, we gotta we gotta see the the, the, the hitman uh no, I, I, I definitely you know. will be there. You know, you mentioned before before we go, you mentioned before about the China Club. I was a big regular there and no, some the cat club. The, the, no, the cat the, club. The cat club. That's what I meant. The cat club. The China the, Club is where yeah. you would go to hang out with Bianca Jagger. Right, though. The cat club snort I, coke I used, off of her I used ass. to go to a lot. I saw a lot of great bands there and I missed you guys. 
guys. That that annoys me that I miss. We you. played there so many times. You know, they most of their shows, from what I recollect, were on Wednesday, Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights, yeah. It was a metal night. Right? It was metal night. Yeah. And that was a bitch yeah. for me because I had a, a full time job and I had to get up really early and I did take advantage of a couple that I had to see. I remember I saw Leatherwolf, I saw Lizzie Borden, I saw Sabotage. Mm. But it, the Wednesday night was a killer because I had to go to work the next day, you know, and uh, I didn't get to see every band that I wanted to see. And I would have loved to have seen you guys back then. But I, 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 We actually hung out. I wasn't a big hanger outer, but I loved the scene there. Because you oh, go in there place. and I love like that place. Mick Jagger would be there or you know, cool crazy place. people would be hanging out in that place. And you get to meet everybody and they were so nice. The guys and from I, the I band used to hang out at the bar. Always. When because I, everyone loved Don Hill because he was one of the greatest it, it people was, ever. It was a really cool place. And yeah, when I, I heard you played there, I, you, yeah. yes, I missed you. And it was a great gig. Small stage, great sound. Yes. It sounded great. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we always knew that you know we the the sound would always be really good there. But it was a tiny room, and it's a shame that you know that era's over. But you know, we got yeah. to do it. These yeah. kids today, they don't. What do they get to do? They get to go to a, a DJ rave, go yeah. watch a guy stick a USB <laughs> stick in his MacBook. Right. <laughs> Yay. Exactly. I know. Exactly. <laughs> Lucky them. <laughs> yep. You know what? I got a lot of memories. That's. Uh... Yeah. There you go. Yeah, and you know what? If you wanted to get laid that night, you didn't have to go on Hinge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i know and i was you'd just be like john and be like hey you banging i was single i was single at that point i was already i was already in between marriages at that point so. you were between marriages <laughs> between well marriage. there was never there was never a shortage of uh no there was a lot of girls of, there yeah no there was. there was so many girls back in the day with the big sprayed hair yep, yep. and you know the dance skins and the capizios but you know what Everybody i used to, what i used to do dirk i used to break it in two because i was so nuts for this stuff that when i went to see a band I really wasn't interested in the women. So what I would do is go on Friday nights. There was a place in Bay Ridge that was like a real big pickup place. 2001 Odyssey. Disney. Well, that was one of them. That was that was one of them. There was uh, a place called Pastels. Okay. And, no, no, um, no. Yeah. So that's that, that was my Friday nights. That was looking for the women. And Saturday Did nights was usually Lamores to see bands. Oh, yeah. Did you ever go to a place on Queens Boulevard called... Um, it was a place... Where guys used to go to pick up older ladies. That like wasn't my thing women. back then. Yeah, now I don't. <laughs> I, actually, it wasn't even my thing uh, recently. <laughs> I've never been big with women that were weak within 20 years of my own age. <laughs> Typical man. How many times have you been divorced, Tom? <laughs> That's probably why I've been divorced a few times, as Mark readily knows. I used to show up at you know you know what the key, like, you know what was the solution to that is don't get married. <laughs> no, I know. Go. Well, yeah. Well, it's, unfortunately, it's, it took me till I was sixty three to figure that one out. But. <laughs> well, hey, anyway, you live and learn. You know, I mean, it, it, like I said, I think we're gonna have to do two parts for for sure on this one, right? <laughs> we may have to have but, you back. We may yeah. have to make you as a third member of the Jersey guy. <laughs> there you go. All right. <laughs> My sister lives in Jersey. There hey, you go. That's you close go. enough. There you go. Well, we're in she lives in Jersey. In, she lives in the town where all the house wives live the town where all the housewives oh live. the uh, hmm. the jersey housewives that's uh, franklin lakes franklin lakes yeah oh i didn't yeah. know that yeah <laughs> i'm up up, up so in north jersey tom's in central jersey so you know i'm in so where you up in like oh freehold okay yeah no. i'm in carney oh carney yeah, i just spelled, moved out here a year spelled ago Kearney, sp it's pronounced but it's carney. carney i only carney. moved here a year ago so i Actually, really, a kind of a bogus Jersey guy. But. <laughs> Where are you from originally? Long Island? Uh, Brooklyn for 30 years. Oh, and yeah. And I was in Staten yeah. Island for 30 years. Yeah, you, you, you still have a, a rather pronounced New York accent. Yeah, just you, a little think? bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> We've done some interviews with guys from the other side of the country, and they're like, holy. <laughs> well, we're from we, Brooklyn, are you? <laughs> we hope that uh, you know maybe a year, another year into this, you'll well, be like, yeah, like the guy from uh, Journey. Where no, you know, yeah, accent. <laughs> <laughs> old dog new trick no that's not gonna happen nah, you, know? not, not at this stage you don't lose like do you say stuff is mint that's mint no i don't use mint no <laughs> i never liked mint even back in the day i wasn't big on oh mint. man yeah that car is mint. it was a guido term. i was never really a guido so it was kind of a guido term i was always a rocker from from a little kid so yeah that was a guido term mint <laughs> yeah, mint. Your was caddy it? was mint. Your, your leather oh, jacket that. was mint. Yeah. Yeah, the jacket was mint because he got it at Wilson's. Right. right. <laughs> the house of Sweden leather. House of Sweden leather. 
<laughs> oh boy. Uh, I, there's I, nothing I, better than New York in the eighties, man. It was the yep, greatest. Absolutely. Yep. Did you go down to the Hasidics on Orchard Street to buy your motorcycle jackets? Um not I, I used I had a great motorcycle jacket that I got in the the village in the early eighties that I still have to this day, but I didn't get it on uh, Orchard Street. I still have it in my closet upstairs. That's how Shot was like. the brand you wanted to get. Shot was the number one brand. But if you went down to the Hasidic guys, if you were the first guy in the door, uh, you could haggle with them and they'd have to take your price because it's bad luck for them to refuse the first sale of the day. So we used to go down there and say, I'll give you 10 bucks. Yeah, really? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, back, up, back up past me. It's good stuff. All it's right, all we, gone now. If we don't see you by no by October, we, we might call you before then to come back on the show. <laughs> sure, I had a lot of fun, man. Yeah, or even when you know when a new album comes. I out. I hope I don't get know. in a lot of trouble. I hope anybody doesn't get mad at me nah, telling no, stories. But I don't give a shit anymore. <laughs> I don't either. See, Mark does because he's such a young guy. I, I don't either. I, <laughs> I'm constantly making enemies with the. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to make money, you know, enemies out of, you know, because for the most part, I, it's very few and far between that I've ever met a complete asshole in this business. I've met them, um, but I met some incredible people. You know, most of the bands we've ever played with have been great and gracious to us. But like, you know, like I've met Joe a couple of times. He's always been great to me, but, you know, he's fun to, you know, he's got a couple of idiosyncrasies that are right. fun to point out. Yeah. You know, it's all done with uh, in, in the best possible way. Uh, Oh, Light and love. Definitely. <laughs> well, everybody, um, Dirk Kennedy from uh, Hitman again. And uh, we appreciate your time tonight. And, and we definitely, like you said, Tom said, we got to get you back, uh, you know, yeah, at some point. Yeah, I'd love and, it. Uh, yeah, and we'll see you out. in October. Yeah, sure. We'll see you in Absolutely. October. Absolutely. I can't wait. Thanks for having me again. All right. Appreciate bye -bye. it, Dirk. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, fellas. Bye. All right. Bye.